And the Lord gave King Cushan Rishatayim of Aram into his hand, and his hand prevailed over Cushan Rishatayim. And so the land had 40 years, had rest for 40 years. And then Othniel of Kenaz died. I'm sorry, Othniel, the son of Kenaz, died. It doesn't get any better. That's a beautiful story. And it's a beautiful story because there's no extraneous type of crap. <laughs> right? we, just, we just basically take that same exact cycle that was mentioned in chapter 2, and we just lay it right out there. It's a perfect, perfect cycle. There's not a word, practically, that's here that's not necessary. There's no extraneous stuff. The cycle holds. Everything's present. Everything's accounted for. It's beautiful. Don't get used to it. <laughs> Let's take a look at Echad. Notice what happens with Echad. And again, just notice literarily what happens with Echad. Again, you were asking last time about rhetoric, right? Here's a good example, for me at least, here's a good example. And again, it's the thing that the fourth paper is going to be on. But just notice what happens. So now you have Othniel. Notice how the story of Echad changes it. Cool? So be sure and keep your fingers going right for the different parts. The Israelites again did what was evil on the side of the Lord. The Lord strengthened King Eglon of Moab against Israel because they had done what was evil on the side of the Lord. In alliance with the Ammonites and the Amalekites, he went and defeated Israel. And they took possession of the city of Palms. And so the Israelites served King Echlon of Moab 18 years. How long did they serve Kushan? Eight, eight, eight years. Now it's 18 <coughs> years, right? Again, every time you go around. Right. But when the Israelites cried out to the Lord, the Lord raised up for them a deliverer, Ehud, the son of Gera, a ben, a, the Benjaminite. He's a left-handed man, which isn't important right now. And I don't know why you're even mentioning that. Notice what happens right here. We're at part four. Evil sells them into the hands of their enemies. They cry out. The Lord raises up for the deliverer effort. So far, so good? Notice what happens right now. It's at the end of that beautiful cycle, we insert a huge story about how that happens, how he delivers them. He doesn't just deliver them. We insert a huge story. Because I can tell you, by the end, you can see there, um, in verse 30. So Moab was subdued that day under the hand of Israel, and the land had rest for 80 years. You see that? So there's the end of the cycle. So what we do here is that we insert a huge story about how he delivers Israel, which keeps the cycle, but it expands it. So far, so good? You know what I'm talking about? Again, I'm not making things actually rather simple. Is that the deliverance? Is, is inserted or, or at the point where there's deliverance, we actually tell the story. And here's the story. We might as well read it. Echod made for himself a sword with two edges. So it's not like a machete. It's a sword with two sharp sides. So far, so good. That's going to be important. Again, there's nothing in this story that's not important. So it's a, it's a sword with two sharp sides. So it's not something you would hack. It's something you would do something else with. Um, and the Israelites sent tribute by him to King Eglon of Moab, right? So Echad made for himself, I'm sorry, a sword with two edges. It's about a cubit in length. It's about so big. Cool. Um, and he fastened it on his right thigh under his clothes. Well, that's silly. He fastens it on his right thigh. Well, that's kind of awkward, because you're going to pass on the left. So he's going to have to, like, reach. Oh, that's right. He's left-handed. So whenever you're going through the airport and the, you know, the metal detector or something, the metal detector is only going to be left checking over your left, right? He fastens it on his right thigh under his clothes, and then he presented the tribute to King Eglon of Moab. Here's all the money that you're due, bastard. Here. Now Eglon was a very fat man, very large. Oh, the word Eglon in Hebrew means calf. <laughs> There's a fat calf. <laughs> and we know what happens to fatted calves. <laughs> Barbecue. Uh, so Eglon was a very fat man. And when Echud had finished presenting the tribute, he sent the people who carried the tribute on their way. But he himself turned back to the sculptured stones near Gilgal, and he came back to um, Eglon, and he said, I got a secret message for you, O king. And I can tell you it's a message 
with a point. Okay. <laughs> maybe, maybe you don't know the story. <laughs> so, anyway, um, I've got a secret message for you, O king. And the king said, silence! And all the attendants went out from his presence, because, of course, that's what you want to do. <laughs> If you have someone that you're exacting tribute from, you want to be alone in a room with them. <laughs> Idiot. Um, so Ehud came to him while he was sitting alone in his cool roof chamber. So he was sitting in his cool roof chamber, because it's a main ancient world, right? He's sort of that house. Right? But then, you don't really live down there, especially in the summer, well, three quarters of the year. What you do is that there's actually a part up here um, that usually has a lattice. Um, and so it's like, you know, screen, right? And so it's, you know, patio or something. And so it's up here. Um, and so the breeze can go through it. So it's cool. So far, so good, right? So he's up here in his cham our chamber. Um, and the other thing that happens up here is you go to the restroom in a pot or something. And then a pot or something, of course you go to the restroom up here. You don't want to go up here. Because if you go up here, the breeze sort of wafts everything away. So far, so good? So just notice he's sitting in his upper roof chamber. <laughs> and he's alone. And he said, I've got a message from God for you. And so he arose from his seat. And then Ehud reached with his left hand, he took the sword from his right thigh, and he thrust it into Eglon's belly, and the hilt is so large. Again, it's a cubit long. And he's so large that it doesn't come out the other side. The whole thing goes in, including the handle. Exactly. <laughs> The whole thing goes in, the hilt also went in after the blade, and then the fat closes over the blade, <laughs> and he couldn't draw it out. And um, dirt comes out. It's not dirt. Unless he's been eating dirt. And he hasn't been eating dirt. The word that's dirt here in Hebrew shit. But you can't say that in church. So we say dirt, which is just strange. Um, so all this stuff starts coming out, right, from the wound. And then Ehud went out into the vestibule, and he closed the doors of the roof chamber, and he locks them. So they're so good. And after he had gone, the servants came, and when they saw that the doors of the roof chamber were locked, this is, this is Roy Heller. And they took a whiff. They said, oh, he's got to be relieving himself in the cool chamber. <laughs> My lord, that, what did he eat? <laughs> and so they waited. Until they're embarrassed. <laughs> What's he doing in there? Oh. When he still didn't open the doors of the roof chamber, they finally took the key, they opened them, and oh my lord, there was their lord lying dead on the floor. In a big pool of stuff, dirt. <laughs> right. Meanwhile, Ehud escaped while they delayed. He passed the sculptured stones, and he went to uh, Sa'ira. When he arrived, he took the trumpet in the hill country of Ephraim, and the Israelites went down with him from the hill country, having him at their head. And he said to them, follow after me, for the Lord has given your enemies, the Moabites, into your hand. And so they went down after him and seized the fords of the Jordan against the Moabites and allowed no one to cross over. And at that time, they killed about 10,000 of the Moabites, all strong, able-bodied men. No one escaped. And so Moab was subdued that day under the hand of Israel, and the land had rest for 80 years. Just notice, and there's our final thing, right? So we subdues Moab, and there's rest. So far, so good? But you just notice that we had this incredibly long, hilarious story sort of thrown in there. Cool. Um, Notice what we have after that. And actually, this is kind of important. 31. After him came Shamgar, the son of Anak, who killed 600 of the Philistines with an ox goat. He too delivered Israel. <laughs> <laughs> the 
the hell is that doing? <laughs> it doesn't. It doesn't fit. I mean, it's good. It's not bad, but it doesn't. It doesn't. Right? Okay. Whatever. Shamgar. Sure. Whatever. Um, chapter four. This is kind of important too. In four, notice again, notice the way the NRHV says it here. The Israelites again did what was evil in the sight of the Lord after Ehud died. You see that? And again, you just have to trust me here, unless you take Hebrew and you can actually read it. Um, it doesn't say that in English. I mean, it doesn't say that in Hebrew. It says that in English, but it doesn't say that in Hebrew. This is what it says in Hebrew. It says, the Israelites again did what was evil in the sight of the Lord. Ehud died. You notice what's happened. We've had the pattern set up so that the land has rest for 40 years, the judge dies, and then they do evil in the sight of the Lord. Right here at the very end, not only do we have Shamgar, for some ungodly reason, thrown in there, but also just two clauses are reversed. They do evil in the sight of the Lord, and Ehud dies. Just a little switch, but you notice it breaks the pattern. Because I lied to you. <laughs> um, in fact, what we have here is not a cycle that goes all the way through. Because starting right here at the end of Ephod, what's going to start happening is that that pattern, and you can trace this out, or you can buy the book. Um, you can actually trace this out, and that is that pattern that's established in the second introduction, or the first introduction, which is the second. Um, laid out right there in chapter 2, absolutely clear in Othniel, absolutely clear up until the last clause of Ehud. What starts happening is that that pattern starts breaking apart. Things start missing. Things start, just like we saw, getting switched until finally I can tell you, spoiler alert, by the time we get to Samson, the only thing that's going to be there is that the Israelites are going to do evil in the sight of the Lord. And then maybe God will raise up a deliverer. Depends on how you see Samson. So, things are going to start. The, 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 what is it? William, but William, sorry. The center cannot hold. right? Um, and that pattern is going to start disintegrating. And this pattern starts disintegrating as a result, as a symbol, as a reflex, as an illustration of the way in which Israel itself, Israel itself, who is the main character in this tragedy. Israel itself starts falling apart until we wind up with chaos. So, <clears throat> let's do this one more story and then we're going to jump. Because this is kind of an important story. We're going to read through the, uh, the Deborah story here. Cool. Yeah, well, we'll see. Uh, I don't know if you want to. Yeah, in Roy Heller's class, you might not want to identify with people too quickly. Um, what I want you to do, again, you know the pattern, you've seen the pattern three times now. What I want you to do is that there's one part of the pattern that's going to be missing here. Oh, spoiler alert, right? So, just notice what isn't here. It's a great story, but just notice where the pattern gets broken. Here we go. The Israelites again did what was evil on the side of the Lord, after it died. So the Lord sold them into the hand of King Jabin of Canaan, who reigned in Hatzor. The commander of his army was Sisera, who lived in Haroshet Hagoyim. Then the Israelites cried out to the Lord for help, because he had 900 chariots of iron, and he had oppressed the Israelites cruelly for 20 years. 1820. At that time, Deborah, a prophetess, the wife of Lapidot, was judging Israel. She used to sit under the palm of Deborah between Ramah and Bethel in the hill country of Ephraim. And the Israelites would come up to her for judgment because she's smart. She understands things. She can, she, she's fair. right? She can make decisions that everybody may not like, but at least they can agree on. Um, she sent in Southern Barak, the son of Abinoam, from Kedesh and Naphtali. And she said to him, and again, sorry to keep doing this, but it, actually it doesn't say this. The Lord, the God of Israel, you need to take Hebrew. Uh, the Lord, the God of Israel, commands you. It doesn't say that. What it says is, hasn't the Lord, the God of Israel, commanded you? It 
It's a question. It's a rhetorical question. In fact, Barack has already been told. She's not telling him something that he hasn't known. He's already been told, go, take position at Mount Tabor, bringing 10,000 from the tribe of Naphtali and the tribe of Zebulun. I will draw out Sisera, the general of Jabin's army, to meet you by the Wadi Kishon with his chariots and his troops, and I will give him into your hand. But God has already told him this. He hasn't done a darn thing. Deborah comes up and says, hasn't the Lord told you to do this? So far, so good? Again, it seems as though Barak, at least from that reading, is a reluctant type of person. God tells him to do something, but he doesn't do it. And then Deborah comes along and repeats it, and this is what he says. All right, let's go. <laughs> You've convinced me. No, he says, if you will go with me, I will go, but if you will not go with me, I will not go. And she said, well, okay, then I'll go with you. Nevertheless, the road on which you are going will not lead to your glory, because the Lord will sell Sisera into the hand of a woman. And at this point, it's very clear who the woman's going to be. Ta-da! Deborah. So far, so good? That's the expectation, right? So Deborah got up and went with Barak to Kedesh. Barak summoned Zebulun and Naphtali to Kedesh, and 10,000 warrants went up behind him, and Deborah went up with him. And then we have a little commercial, <laughs> which isn't important right now. Heber, the Kenite, had separated from other Kenites. And these aren't, this is not an Israelite tribe, this is some Amorite tribe, this is something else. Heber, the Kenite, had separated from the other Kenites. That is, the descendants of Hobab, the father-in-law of Moses. And this Heber had encamped as far away as um, Elon, Elon Baza'ananim, which is near Kedesh. Pray you're never a lector when you have to read that <laughs> on Sunday. Elon Baza'ananim, uh, which is near Kedesh. Cool, so um, Heber had separated, and he's living all by himself. But that's not important right now. I don't even know why we're mentioning that. Um, when Sisera was told that Barak, the son of Abinoam, had gone up to Mount Tabor, Sisera called out all of his chariots, 900 chariots of iron, and all of the troops who were with him, from Harushit HaGoyim to the Wadi Kishon. And then Deborah said to Barak, get up! <laughs> right? What are you doing? Right? She's having to tell him to do everything. You know, it's, like, it's like being a parent, right? Get up! Right? This is the day on which the Lord has given Sisera into your hand. The Lord is indeed going out before you. And so Barak went down to Mat Tabor with 10,000 warriors following him. And the Lord threw Sisera and all of the chariots and all of his army into a panic before Barak. Sisera got down from his chariot and fled away on foot, while Barak, was, uh, while Barak pursued the chariots and the army to Harashit HaGoyim. And the army of Sisera fell by the sword, and no one was left. Except for Sisera, who had escaped. Right? But we, yet again, for me at least, just notice that this deliverance, remember Echad, the deliverance is sort of thrown in there. Same thing is going on here. We have this long story of deliverance. And yet it gets complicated. Because what I'm expecting right here at the end of 16 is where the deliverance should be. And yet, we still have to deal with Sisera, right? And so it's not as simple, it's not an easy type of thing. Sisera fled away on foot to the, wife, to the tent of Jael, the wife of Heber the Kenite. Oh! <laughs> right, sure, because they had separated, because he's living all by himself, and so he runs, and there's this tent in the big middle of nowhere, and so... Um, Jael, the wife of Heber the Kenite, because there was peace between King Jabin of Hatsor and the clan of Heber the Kenite. And so Jael came out to meet Sisera and said to him, Oh, turn aside, my lord, turn aside, don't be afraid. Whenever there's anybody that meets you in the big middle of nowhere, and they say, Isabella, don't be afraid. Be afraid. <laughs> so, oh, no, don't be afraid. And so he turned aside to her in the tent, and she covered him up with a rug. And then he said, She doesn't give him water. She gives him milk. She gave him milk to drink. And then she took the baby blanket. She tucks him in again. 